Ну, батпа сутёка, не на. Что, in the spring of 1958, three English housewives set off on a remarkable journey to the northwest Indian Himalayas. Well, we were just creatures from another planet, I think. They drove from London to Delhi. Their aim was to trek into the forbidden Tibetan Buddhist kingdom of Zanskar, one of the highest inhabited valleys on the planet. They had never seen white women before. They called me the yellow-haired woman. <laughs> Pila Bal Valley. <laughs> Fifty years later, I was heading by road to Padam, the capital of Zanskar. I had with me a copy of the expedition film, the first moving footage ever shot in the region. I was hoping to use this film as an opportunity for reflection on how life had changed in the valley in the intervening years. Little did I know I was about to witness a dark period in Zanskar's history, with villagers struggling to contain a new, and formidable enemy. Meet three remarkable women. All married to mountaineers, they decided that anything their husbands could do, they could do better. So Anne Davis, leader of the Women's Overland Himalayan Expedition, Antonia Decock in charge of foreign relations and the expedition's equipment, and Evelyn Sims, who was responsible both for navigation and for rations, went by Land Rover to the Himalayas and back. The men all went off into uh, another room and were having a sort of committee meeting and the wives were left together and with an Indian officer and he said, well, what are you girls going to do whilst your men are away? And one of us said, oh, we're going to go have our own expedition. And when our husbands came back, we said, we're going to go on an expedition as well. And to our amazement, they said, yes, why not? <laughs> We didn't regard it as an adventure, you know. It was just something we wanted to do, and it was a good idea. And uh, you didn't even know that Zanskar was forbidden, did you? No, no, we didn't. <laughs> it was just in our minds, and we were talking about it, writing to one another, telephoning, and um, then somebody told the press. And once the press came and questioned us, we said, well, we jolly well got to go now. We, we, this is, has made it, that we've, we've got to get there. <laughs> There's an inner line that was drawn way back in the time of, uh, of the 1800s, along the line, and they said that people had to have permission to go over because the country beyond was rather wild and um, very little um, chance of being rescued if they got into trouble and that sort of thing. And uh, we wanted to go quite well beyond it. It seemed a forlorn hope until the three had an hour's interview with India's Prime Minister, Mr Nehru, in Delhi. He said, I can see no reason why you three young ladies should not visit Saskar. I will ask my foreign secretary to let you have a pass. About two days later, the Himalayan club had a meeting and we went along and they were incredulous that we could possibly have got this permit because lots of people had tried to get them and they were turned down.
Like many mountain regions, the Himalaya had become an imaginary landscape, a repository for hopes and dreams, a safe haven, a Shangri-La. Zanskar had been one of the last regions to be open to foreign visitors. Isolated by sensitive borders and long winters, the valley had been off limits for over a century until trekkers started arriving in the mid-1970s. As a young photographer, I travelled to Zanskar in the mid-1980s, spending time in the villages and staying with a local family. As part of my journey, I was hoping to meet Nurbu, only a young boy during my last visit, now at university and home for the summer holidays. Working with local filmmaker Skarma Ritchin and his colleague Tashi Svalgon, we hoped to make a film which both celebrated and demystified life in this remote Himalayan valley, and perhaps find a link with the women's journey 50 years before. And the rank screen services. The idea was they lend us a Bell and Howell cine camera, and I'd, I'd use the 8 mil, so I, that was my job. And uh, we would take shots of us in the Himalayas and the journey out, and then they would have the film. It never, never occurred to us that anything wrong would ever happen to us. We were qu quite confident that we'd do it with, safely. I suppose sort of stupidity. <laughs> The current was very strong, and uh, I fell because Namgyal stood on my foot. Water was knee-deep in places, flowing madly, and I scold, which after the initial shock wasn't too bad. A bit wet and miserable. <laughs> but we, we, we went in behind some rocks and changed and set off nice and dry again. Zombazan, <laughs> Yeah, 
就是通通的，我一弄不能啦，只管开平打，啥尿上都过。尿上都过。嗯那不得晓得，我也不得晓得。这个手呢，手是脱不了的。哈哈。Maybe it must be someone from Hematchal. I remember this, 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 uh, uh, this kind of uh, trekking. <coughs> The women had reached Padam in the summer of 1958 after trekking for three weeks from the nearest roadhead at Manali. We had driven along the only road into the valley, which had been built in the late 70s. Yet within four years, a new all-weather road from Ley would be completed, thus ending Zanskar's unique isolation forever. Padam was now a small, bustling town, where people arrived every week, leaving their villages in search of a new way of life. Yeah. <laughs> 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 So we do about ten miles a day, and um, they were put. Uh, 
porters would put up our tents and we would cook our dehydrated food. It was always curry because you can do an awful lot. We took it in turns. Can, all our curries were different. Same ingredients, but they were all different. The Rotang's 10,000, we came down to 9, then we went up to 11, and we had the Barra La Chula, and the last one uh, was the Poet La, and uh, on the Poet La we camped, and we sort of walked up a thousand feet and did our, uh, our Himalayan peak. <laughs> In the first week of April 2004, while we were clearing off the snow from the top of the roof, we noticed a thin cloud floating over sunny and after some time, a thin cloudy dispersed and a thin layer of earth was laid all over the snow half of the mountain. And some people say that with this wind, people have seen many bugs and uh, some also say that uh, there were tiny insects with this uh ตัวตัวมาจิตตะโกสมจิงเลจิตุนจิตุนสมจิงจิตุนเลจิลตุกโนยาตัวจิตาเอเนเลดละญีโนเลดินัมเบอร์มิบะอิงกันจิตานัม
They called me the yellow-haired woman. <laughs> Pila Balwali. <laughs> They were very interested in our anoraks. Uh, the zip fasteners, they'd never seen a zip fastener before. And we had numerous people come and zip and unzip. Uh, uh, in fact, everything that we brought out, um, they had never seen a mirror. And uh, one poor woman, she, she was very elderly and she saw her face and she was absolutely horrified and terrified of her own face. <laughs> We had lilos, and in those days, a lilo had a little pump like that, and it had a little spout which was red, and it was a tube. You see, and you put that into your thing, and you you sort of pumped it. And the women would pick up our tent flaps and, and peer inside. You see, and they came across this, and they uh, saw this and that, this thing sticking out, and they they giggled like fun and made very suggestive <laughs> gestures. <laughs> So we said, oh, no, 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 horrified, horrified. You know, it wasn't exactly a sex aid. <laughs> Everything was a novelty, and the interaction was extremely rewarding on both sides, I feel. Well, we were just creatures from another planet, I think. Cha <laughs> Young <laughs> Don't <laughs> I pipiting ni sala pisapa. Then it tell you when I'm a young park and big machu. Then in Jinning Kong, Yangazi, Tangju Sapa, Tarba de Lep. Then in Ninta Mani Korangazo, Chipa Purzos, Kong Katang, Amani, Tring and Andu Tora, Kalabs, Nala, Ilunju, and Duzella, Ye Kalabs, Duzer Sizions, and a Tianaman is in the Chep Chep Manichet and Konang Yemen Gogon, Piru and a Jing Jerry Chep Chep Kalir Jerule. Then <laughs> Rimbuchebe, Sugula, Jinsasal, 
তিনি তে হর বঙ্গ জিতে খায় একজন সঙ্গে লংমি মানে টাচ মাজুলে মানে নাম মানে লংমি ตาเซนิชินเซงะเซกนโดตับชินเซนะเซนิชิมะลังาเซเปมังาตองซะเปมังาตองเอเนงาโกนโดตับกะซุนโดเซนะงานิโตรคอมชุกอมชิงลังา
ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、
Um, well, I suppose we're very, in many, many ways, although we were very naive and we didn't appreciate how rare it was to be invited into a gompa um, and, you know, what an honour it was. And there was a little little man came, one of the monks came with a little uh, rush br uh, br broom made of, of rushes and he started sweeping the dust up and we got absolutely covered in this, this fine powder. Now, please choose a corner channel, Buddhism Tornil, Nata Nalate, his trees in the pay. Sending Nata many to Totten, the Chen Dals and Guru, Rumbuche, to Totten Yenani, the Chen Dals and Hanji, Chen Lapman, Nata Mutano. Take an animal lie Jagging Boozer and Nemes Calfen and Junkazano. Jungbez and Eten and Guru Rumbuche Tamla Taxi, Nenangal, take a short engine, and state in Zoskuma Pujik, many wool, the many Yazula, many. Long time is any ten not pass in other hands, it has so many Ferraz in being to pair. Chairs and not teens of schools here and I'm going to meet to Zapta and Scalpana Fedezula, many circa and Rimpir in being Juric, Zapno. Tea no sconge in other hands, you know, chairs and I'm going to magic chunk as a Lugus in Dupil. According to local testimonies, weather patterns were changing in Zanskar. Winters were becoming shorter and summer rains heavier. Locusts are known to migrate on the prevailing winds of rainstorms, but others were saying the cooler winters meant the locust eggs were now able to survive the traditionally harsh Zanskari winter. Perhaps there was a link between their presence and a changing climate system. Perhaps I was just seeking easy explanations. Clearly further research needed to be done. Maybe like all events in life, there was no single cause. The locusts simply representing the misfortunes that can befall us at any time for no apparent reason. For the Zanskaris, however, this was not the case. Something was out of balance, and every negative event, according to the laws of karma, had an identifiable cause, and the villagers were dealing with the locust problem in a pragmatic way, even if a conflict between scientific and religious methods was to be the outcome. Something had to be done.
final dance of the festival ends with the ritual slaying of the ego, the ultimate conquest of the teachings of Buddhism over malignant forces. The purba, or ceremonial dagger, is raised and gently lowered, cutting away the concept of a disconnected universe. There are so many changes in Zanskar uh, in the last 20 years. Some 20 years, ab uh, years ago, there were not uh, no many people were educated. At that time, people were, you know, not that much uh, competitions and everybody was just having their own food and not so much problems. Now, people get more works, more tensions and, you know, more competitions in our field. When I was young, I can see a lots of kids just doing here and there, no schools, uh, not that much stress and not that, that much, you know, effort to the studies or something like that. And now, today, then I can't see a single kid doing here and there because everyone is in schools, everyone is getting education. Yeah, it's very important if you would like to go outside of Zanskar, we must have to be an educated person to interact with the people of outside of Zanskar, to know the life of out, outside of the Zanskar. <laughs> Uh, when a person is much more educated, they want to be life like outside of Zanskar. They want the life to be more comfortable, uh, more electronic, and more computerized. Something like that. I also want to be here, yeah, because I like it. But uh, I also want to be in connection with the outside of Zanskar to get to know what's happening over there and what I can do over here. And uh, yeah, I want to be here. Mm. That's the main thing. I want to be here with my family. I want to do walk over here. You know, I like to sp spend my life over here. We knew we'd got to get back to Manali and load up the Land Rover and drive home again. And um, it was a very difficult trail. In places, the horses would go up, up a bank, and then the mule men had to pull them round by their tails to get them round the corner. Everything was being stored away for the winter, and um, the first snows fell before we actually got um, up over the, the next part on the homeward journey. Stopped a night at Char, four miles from Tether, but having no sugar or tea, we pressed on. <laughs> we must have a chai. Weather very hard, hot, as this valley traps the heat. Max carried and stops frequent at every stream. Fear of getting too dehydrated. Rather a drag, 18 miles in 12 hours, as we packed off at 6 a.m. this morning. Sun warm but with cool breeze, walking pleasant. Lunch is much more substantial now as we cook curry at night and had some cold on Macvita. Sometimes soup, lemonade makes a very good meal. Climbed slightly up to a head of valley where we crossed a stream followed by a very steep path to campsite at foot of Glacier. 4.30 p.m. and we decided to take Ovaltine film. I was excused my cooking char and dashed about filming background shots of peaks, us arriving and generally messing about. Rather stagey, but hope it satisfies rank screen services. They bought us the 16 mil, 160 pounds, and loaned it to us for the express perfect purpose of taking over to advertisements. True life adventure series, huh?
The lasting impression of the, uh, the expedition so many years ago was to realize how privileged we had been to witness and partake to some degree in societies that were virtually stranger to modern world that we know. The transition with the flood of tourism worldwide has probably been as traumatic for these, some of these communities as has the technological advance at the speed in which we have to accept it has affected our lives. Do you think 50 years ago your impression was that there was a general contentment? There seemed to be. Um, they didn't know anything else. And if you don't know anything else, you're not hankering for something. I think that, that, that was what I felt. Women climbers home again from the Himalaya, or Himalaya, fed up with dehydrated steak. Harwich, October the 8th. As the three young women walked down the gangplank of the night ferry from the Hook of Holland at Harwich this morning, your correspondent agreed with one of the husbands that they're all pretty good looking, even though I do say so myself, not the old haggard old explorers one would expect. But actually the funny thing was when we got back, the most difficult driving we had was from Harwich into London. <laughs> that was much harder than any of the other countries we've been through. Well, my name is Tanzin Norbu and uh, I'm from Testa. When I was young in Zanskar, there wasn't very good school. And being a hard climate and difficult environment, the teacher generally stay very little time. My parents thought this is not a good situation. So they decided to send me out for study in Manali. When I finished my schooling in Manali, uh, I went to Jammu University. And afterward, I got opportunity to study in UK. And uh, I became kind of first Zanskari uh, who graduated in one of the European University. Has Manali changed? Right? Yeah. That's the mm. name of the place. Mm. It's a long time ago, so I've forgotten quite a yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, it's 50 <laughs> years, so it's, it's <laughs> certainly, yeah, yeah, yeah. well. Hmm. So um, I was looking in the photograph there. Um, I wonder where did you camp in Testa? In the, because there's a village. Yeah. Um, I hope you... the, the, there were sort of round places. I think they yeah. thrashed the corn. That's right. Yeah, and is we it? Camped. We camped. It wasn't corn time. No, no. So we yes. they put us to camp there. Yes. We asked the head man of the village. Yes. And he said, yes, you can camp there. Right. The where the head man lived? He lived in one of those little houses. In the village? In or? the village. Yeah. Is there is a house just below the village? Just, one? just below, yes. Just that, below the village. That's the house where he lived. I think so. Yeah, and you camp in front of that house. Yeah, and he was very kind when we we did had we were running short of time. Yes. And so we made that quick dash to Pardum. Yes. And he let us store our stuff in in, in a house. room in his yeah. house. And so I I have very much I I think I'm sure like this is my parent house. Yes. That the house where you put your stuff. Ah. This is from the village. From the village. Yeah. They look just like the children that I saw. Yes, that's Tessa. This is my parent house. Oh. It's another one, a little closer. <laughs> and this is on the way to Padum. To Padum. Yeah. That's the sign of... Tanzin's meeting with Anne was the personal connection with the film I'd been looking for. So 
He was the link between Zanskar's past and Zanskar's future. And for me, the circle was now complete. Thank you very much. Thank you. When, when I was a boy, I remember similar sort of things, but not exactly what I've seen in, this, um, in the films. What I really find it out, the, the, the peoples are very innocent, very, very innocent um, in, in the film, which is now, if I compare now in Zanskar, is very different. Uh, people seem very relaxed. Um, well, now people, people have no time. They're, they're always busy. If you go in the village, you can't find people. I mean, those, those days, people have lots of time. Even my parents used to say, like, um, if, if a travels, if they see a travel traveler coming to their village, so all the villagers just run behind them to give them hospitality or these sort of things, to say hello or hi or bring food and drink or invite them in the house. But these days you can't see people in the village. They're completely empty village in summer because people are busy in their job. Um, as far as I concerned that we are going to modernize one day, um, there's no question because it's, it's, it's very difficult to escape from modernizations, uh, from the change, and we are going to change. So what we really need is to prepare ourselves for the change. So we need a good change, so which is, I think, only possible through a good education. We need, we need some sort of wisdom because um, personally I do believe education doesn't mean only reading and writing. Education is something beyond that. It's something about, if you talk about uh, working in a field or cultivating crops or irrigations, I think this all is part of education. So we need to learn all these things as well. We need to give value of this, this thing there. Until or unless we don't know these all the small things I think it's an incomplete education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 